Welcome to Abbey Road, where this is the second annual BBC Introducing Masterclass. So my name's Tom Robinson. I present the six music introducing shows. We're going to have a workshop on how to get the best out of less than optimum conditions. So the technicians of BBC Introducing have created a pub venue for us. We're going to have a look at ways of getting the best looking show and best sounding show out of those circumstances. What we're basically talking about, focusing on here, the business of standing up in front of an audience and delivering what it is you've been working on all those months and years. It's not a universal truth that I'm telling you here. These aren't standard rules. This is just personal opinion from me. Things that have worked for me, other things may work for you. So take it all with a pinch of salt. You take what you find useful and um, just leave what you don't find useful. So. We're focusing on solo performance because uh, technically it's much easier than getting a drummer on and off the stage, getting a balance with the band, and the same rules apply. Who here actually is a singer? Okay, is there anybody here who isn't a singer but who has to sing anyway? Yeah, <laughs> lots, of, lots of people. Well, the thing is, it's about finding your own voice, not singing like somebody else. If you think about it, Tom Waits, Lou Reed, Bob Dylan, people pay hundreds of dollars a ticket to go and see them. Anybody can sing. So it's just a question of finding your own voice. Some performers have a natural gift and a charisma. We've all seen those bastards who can just like pick up a guitar, open their mouths, and they're wonderful. And everybody in the room goes, ah. But most of us, it isn't like that. Uh, most of us don't have natural charisma. It's a, it's a process that can be worked at and learned and studied. And it's like any kind of exercise. Going to the gym, the more you do something, the better you get at it. The, the easier it becomes and the more adept you get at it. So the first key to... Confident performance is preparation. If you were going up on a high wire act at a circus, you would want to practice just above the ground first. You'd want to check your own wire before you went up there. You would absolutely prepare everything that you did. Whether you perform with a guitar or with a keyboard or with a loop station or a laptop or a backing tape, whatever it is, you're going to need the instrument, the laptop or whatever it is, a stand to put it on so that you can put it down, take a drink, change instruments, talk to the audience. It's always good to have a stand. And, of course, the thing that all of us forget from time to time, the strap. And, of course, a cable. Checked before I came out from home. And in the bag there is a spare cable and a spare strap. It costs you nothing to have two cables instead of one, to have two straps instead of one. If you use a capo, you'll want a capo and a spare capo in case you lose it or in case somebody needs to borrow one. If you use a tuner, you'll want a guitar tuner. If you use a guitar tuner, you'll want a spare 9 volt battery in case the battery goes on the gig, in case the battery in the guitar goes. That preparation makes a difference. And as you're putting it all together before you go out to play the gig, it helps you focus on what you're going to be doing that evening as well. So it's all that process of just getting into the zone for when you perform. Also consider taking spare strings, a string winder, so that you can quickly change strings, a pair of pliers, so you can cut off those ends of the strings that are sticking on the top. Also to have your own black gaffer tape. Black rather than silver, because silver catches the lights and it shows up wherever you've stuck it to mend something or uh, to mark something out on the stage, black disappears into the background. And I'd suggest your own vocal mic. Your guitarist in your band, they spend a huge amount of money getting their instrument right. You're a singer. What could be more important than the mic that you sing into? Having a mic that you always use, you know the sound of it. I like personally like these Shure 58s, there's the Beta 58, but everyone has their own preference. There's lots of different makes of mic. Those ones work for me because I find them armor plated. And although they color the sound, they color the sound in a really nice way. Just like an amp distorting uh, with your guitar, it's part of the sound. Tuning, it's worth changing your strings before a gig. Not immediately before a gig, because they'll go out of tune all the time, but a day before, or that morning. Change the strings. They sound brighter, they're more responsive, they're mess less likely to break during the show. Now, I know there's not much money out there, and you're thinking, how can I afford to change strings every bloody gig? Well, if you buy online, you can buy Martin M175 strings for £3.25 a set, including postage. You'd spend that on a beer 
in some most of the venues you'll be playing at, three pound twenty-five is worth it. But supposing you do get a break, what are you going to do? What do people do when you if you break a string mid-set? Use another guitar. So bring a spare guitar, not only a guitar, but have a spare on hand. If you haven't got a spare on hand, you could talk to somebody else in one of the other acts that's on and see if you could have a mutual arrangement that you could borrow each other's guitar if there's an emergency. So you could help each other out on that, collaborate, co cooperate on it. What else do people do if you haven't got another guitar? How do you, how do you manage it? Just continue playing with five strings, there's always that. There is a one other option which folk musicians use, which is to have up their sleeve a story, a joke, an anecdote that you can actually tell while you're changing the string yourself. Technology. There are various things you can use to make your sound bigger. They're kind of a mixed blessing. Loop stations are great. They can be really seriously impressive. Backing tracks, laptops can expand your sound enormously. What's the disadvantage? It goes wrong, exactly. Or it limits you so that you have to do the verse here, the chorus there. You have to do it at that tempo. If you're not in key with it, it doesn't work. And also, it bores the audience. If somebody just gets up and presses play, they could listen to your records at home. They don't come to a gig to hear a particular sound. They come to a gig to witness a performance. So if you do use a laptop or a backing tape, Add some live element on top of it, so there is some performance element that's really driving the show as well. And do at least one number in the course of your set without the backing, so that there's a change, so they can hear that you really can play or you really can sing, that you're not dependent on that. Same thing with the loop station. It's good, but it can bore people while you're setting up all the loops and stamping and doing all the clever stuff. Song after song after song after song. And it tends to make the songs too long. So use it as a sensational thing you can do for one or two songs. You know, do it somewhere in the middle of the set to impress people and then bring it back at the finale so that you've actually got loads of you singing along with yourself. That'll work, but don't use it for the whole show. Appearance. What's the best way of looking cool on stage? Pair of shades. Yes, it's always good to wear. Has anybody got a pair of shades that I could possibly borrow? How lucky. That's brilliant. Thank you. Now, let's just see how effective this is at making me cool. Let's pretend the session has started again and uh, I haven't been on yet. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Abbey Road Studio 2. Uh, my name's Tom Robinson. I, I present the Six Music Introducing Show and this is the BBC Introducing Masterclass. Now, how effective was that? at communicating. It looks like, who does he think he is? If you're thinking that, when I'm giving a performance here now, and I am giving a performance, you know, I normally wear a t-shirt and an old pair of jeans. So when you're giving a performance, you need to connect. Anything that gets in the way of connecting is going to make your job harder. Being natural is not the same as being authentic. What you need to be on the stage, above all, is real. Genuinely you, laid on the line. People will respond to that. That's the most scary thing in the world because you're putting yourself out there and you could risk terrible rejection from a whole crowd of people. But if you don't put yourself out there, the performance isn't worth anything. But it's not natural. Natural is wearing a t-shirt and eating food out of the fridge, slobbing around the home. We're talking about putting on a performance. Take an aspect of you that is true, but exaggerate it. So it's authentic, but bigger. Because what feels natural to you, walking down the street in your street clothes, that feels natural. But you put it on a stage and it looks tiny, it looks timid. Whereas what looks natural on stage actually looks completely over the top. If you walk down the street like that, where people go... Tim Minchin, have you ever seen Tim Minchin perform? He actually, before he goes on stage, he puts on his frilly shirts and then he deliberately distresses his hair so that it's really standing out like that and walks out on the stage. Joe Henry who once came in to do a session for me on Six Music. In the flesh, the man looked like a Mississippi showboat gambler. It's an immaculate handmade suit and a bootlace tie, handmade boots with silver buckles down the side and pointed toes. And he said, um, six years ago, I made a conscious decision. I was playing around the bars of the southern states and I found people just didn't take any notice of what I did. I'd just be out there, I'd play some nice songs, they'd clap politely, I'd get off that, they'd forget me because I just walked on in my street clothes, in my jeans, and my t-shirt, and my sneakers. So I spent every last penny I was saving for the album on buying this suit and these boots. And I found when I turned up at the next bar, people went, wow, who's this? 
You've got to carry it off. It's got to be a part of you. He has part of him that is a dandy. But even somebody who has an image of not having an image, think Billy Bragg or Tom York, they're still giving a performance of an exaggerated version of who they really are off stage. The, the kind of unassumingness is itself an image. Uh, Dizzy Rascal walks on stage at Glastonbury wearing T-shirt, trainers, baseball cap, but he's chosen the T-shirt, he's chosen the trainers, he's chosen the baseball cap so carefully. Physical performance. I can't stress enough. You need to drink two and a half liters of water a day. If you're dehydrated, you can't sing properly. The vocal cords are the first thing that dries out. I once lost my voice mid-tour, and I went to see a Harley Street expert, and he charged me, I don't know how many hundreds of pounds, and he said, uh, drink water. So I'm giving it to you for free. <laughs> practice at volume. You practice at home in your bedroom, you don't want your mum to hear, so you sing really quietly. That's no preparation for being up there. Go to a rehearsal room, get the guitar, plug it in, get a mic up, and see what it's like putting the songs over with that kind of volume. Learn the lyrics. Best way to learn lyrics, record them into your phone and play them back while you're doing the washing up or while you're going to sleep, while you're doing other things. Let's get the venue sorted. The goals of playing at the venue are to be seen, to be heard, and to be remembered. Be seen first. Find the place on the stage where you can actually see all of the audience. Good sight lines. So yeah, could you just generally get those lights pointing at where I'm actually standing? Round to the right a bit, and then up, there you are. Once you're blinded, you can be seen. <laughs> Got lights at the side, it'd be good to get some coming as backlights, it'd be good to focus them on other things that you're going to be using, like a piano or whatever. But uh, for now, that's an illustration of how important it is to actually get you lit. The monitors. Normally they're in front of you. I personally prefer to have them off to either side, like side fills. There we go. Just, that just takes away a psychological barrier between you and the audience. Remove visual distractions. I'm going to need some physical help in here. Your pub stage here is full of clutter. It looks awful with all these beer barrels on it. And it doesn't take very much effort to actually just get a working space for you to work in. You've got to feel good about this space. You've got to own it. It's got to be yours. So who's, who's good with carrying stuff? Yep, please. Could you just take all those spare lamps that aren't doing anything and those barrels off the stage for us? The next bit of the transformation is to nip down to your local department store and buy some thin black material comes in one and a half meter widths. I've bought five strips, three meters long. They cut it up for you if you ask them to. It cost me 34 pounds yesterday, just going into the shop. It's not terribly expensive because it can have a huge effect on actually improving what your stage looks like. Uh, Massimo, could you uh, just put them over the top so they hang down there? Because when people take photos of your gig and then post them on Facebook, they're gonna have all that crap in the background and it's going to show that you're playing in a crap gig. But if you can get it all black, it could be anywhere. Drag that over the piano so the piano disappears. Flight cases are always all over the stage. They look ugly, but once again, a small length of black drape can make quite a big difference. So you can clear the, sp clear the stage quite substantially and turn it into a space that belongs to you. And you can point the lights. So there we've got it. Do you agree that looks better? Next thing is get heard. I mentioned bringing your own mic. Apart from anything else, you don't want to be singing down the same mic that a thousand other bands have been spitting into for the last six years at that venue. Most PAs at most venues aren't fully tuned. As the speakers come out of the box and get plugged in, the sound isn't naturally tailored to the room. It's quite important to tune a PA. And if it hasn't been done, you may be able to do it yourself. I tend to take my own graphic EQ with me because this allows me to adjust the sound of the PA. My sound goes into my own mixer, it's only two channels, and then I feed it out to the, to the audience. Here's the natural sound of the PA in the room without any kind of adjustment. That's the kind of boomy noise it makes. But with EQ put in, it goes like that. Is that any better? It just gives you a bit more clarity because it's taken out the, the muzzy frequencies. Now, John, could you explain to them very quickly what you did? All I was doing was just trying to find out which frequencies basically sound the worst and then take some energy out of those frequencies. So all I'm going to do is basically make some noises 
around the frequency range which needs a bit of adjustment as it were so if I go down to the lower notes oh, two yeah there's one there 100 hertz and if you go say if you pick one that's that's pretty rough so it's 100 hertz double that frequency 100 hertz to go to 200 hertz two two yeah and uh, keep going from there basically find out and take away all the kind of like really wrong sounding frequencies as it were but the idea here is you don't do too much because if you do too much you end up really really changing the sound so you're just trying to make stuff a bit more even in the sound as it were best possible outcome for Getting great sound when you play solo is to take your own sound engineer everywhere. Most of us don't have the money or the resources to do that. Then you have to keep an ear on what's happening on the front of, front of house. The person who's doing the sound for you may not know anything about your music and their idea of what you're supposed to sound like and your idea of what you're supposed to sound like may not be anything like the same. Another option is to just take the monitors away and move slightly forward and just listen to the sound of the PA in the room. Have the PA just turn slightly in and just work to that because it puts you in the same space as everybody else. In the old days in clubs, you never had any foldback. You just were in the room and it was reinforcing the sound. So keep an ear on what's going on. Okay, moving smartly on. As you arrive, find out discreetly who's going to pay you. If you're due to be paid, find out when you get there, how and when. Equally important, find a spot in the room to meet and greet people after the show. Somewhere that's well lit, out of the way, not on a main thoroughfare. And I can say at the end of the set, I'll be over there afterwards if anybody wants to come by and say hello. The key thing about gigging live is to make a connection with the audience and to win over new fans, people who will love your music and come to another gig, who will buy your music online, people who support your career in a number of ways. So meeting the public afterwards is really important. Merchandise is your major source of income. What you get paid for the gig will be peanuts, but what you can make by playing a blinding set and really convincing a room full of people, winning them over and then wanting a keepsake to take home with them of that gig is enormous. I can tell you that myself, I played supporting Suzanne Vega once, and they paid me 50 quid, playing at the Marlowe Theatre in Canterbury. And I went out and did the support set, unannounced, unbilled, and as it happened, it went down really well, and in the interval, she wasn't selling any merchandise, so I had my CDs out there. I sold a thousand quids worth of CDs that night as a result of the set. It's better to agree a low gig fee and the right to have merchandise without paying a commission to the venue. But even if you don't have anything to sell or you're not allowed to sell anything, have some flyers with your Facebook address on them, with a photograph and with a free download code so people can like, give their email address and get a free download afterwards. Just something that you can sign as a keepsake of the gig. Something with your upcoming gigs in the area listed on it. Print them off, make them attractive, have them available, hand them out afterwards. Planning a set. The commonest mistake in planning a set is people play too long. Inexperienced musicians particularly play too long. The ideal set I would advise if you're doing a headline set, do 50 minutes. More is not better. You may like smoked salmon, but you don't want half a kilogram of it heaped up on your plate. 50 minutes and then some encores in reserve so you can take it up to 60 if they really, really liked you is good for a headline set. But for a support set, if you can get as many as five songs away, that's perfect. All gigs are different. Everybody has their own style. But here's how I would structure a five-song set. First song has energy, but don't throw away your best song there. Second song, do your very best incredible gobsmacking song second because the first song the sound is still coming right you're getting used to the room they're getting used to you they're only just stopping talking they're only just putting down their drinks and they'll give you a decent applause for the first song anyway so then give them something gobsmacking number two number three song number three ring the changes do something quite different from what you've just done. The first two songs might have been with guitar. That one, next one you might sing a cappella, or you might get out a melodica or play harmonica solo or you might use a beatbox. You might use the loop station on that one. But the texture needs to change so that they don't think, all oh, right, I think I've got the hang of this one. Right, now what were we talking about? So third song, ring the changes, do something different and do something daring. Take a risk. You've hit them with your best song. They've responded well to it take it off to somewhere else. Fourth song, I suggest, 
do a cover version because you want common ground with the audience. If you choose a really carefully selected who you cover and carefully choose the style in which you cover it, it tells them quite a lot about you. It brings them in to your world and you into their world to do a cover. There's some common ground there. And then finally, for the fifth and final song, your most accessible and memorable song, the one that you can really close off with. Anything you do, do big. Don't be feeble or apologetic. Nobody wants somebody to come on and go, um, this is a, a, a new song I finished last week. I don't know if it's any good or not, but uh, um, it, it's about winter. It's called winter. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you want somebody who's going to go out there and seize you by the... That, as a member of the audience, you want somebody to be good. That's the key thing to remember. They don't want you to fail. They want you to be good. And they want you to come in and take charge of what's doing. Uh, so, the four C's of performing. Commitment, conviction, connection, communication. Whether you're Bonnie Ver or pulled, by, pulled apart by horses. I mean, whatever it is, whether it's really delicate, it still needs that kind of absolute focus. It isn't all about sh shouting or making a big noise. For me, it would go something like, come out, come out to the stage, say, hello, my name's Tom Robinson, plugging it in and go, all you kids that just sit and whine, you should have been there back in 79. You say we're giving you a real hard time, you boys are really breaking my heart. Spurs beat Arsenal, what a game, the blood was running in the drains, into city took the trains and really took the place of part. Okay, so that would carry on in that vein. Like that, thank you. Uh... You tattooed me! Tattooed me! I was standing up in Antwerp in the summer of 34. There were teeming streets full of refugees and rumours of a new world war. I was waiting at the station when a newcomer arrived. You took your place and fixed me with those crazy hazel eyes. I would go off into World War Three. Thank you. And I would say, thank you. This is the thing. Acknowledge the applause. Actually, when people applaud, don't start doing your next thing. Don't cut it off with saying... All performance is a dialogue between the audience and the performer. So you have your say, then they have their say. And so stand there, take a compliment. Actually, go, thanks. Don't finish the song and say thanks and wait for the applause. That's horrible. It means thank you for bearing to listen to me. It's a very common thing because people are nervous at the end of the song and they're afraid that some, nobody will applaud. Third song, I thought um, I would probably talk about homophobia and homophobic bullying come out and say look you know when I was 16 I tried to kill myself at school because I was in love with another boy at school and I thought you know I would rather die than anybody find that out and the tragic thing now is that a lot of people are still getting homophobic bullying in today's schools I love hip-hop music I love great drumming I can't drum for toffee and I can't rap for toffee but I love this song this is uh, the disposable heroes of hypocrisy. The first day of school is always the hardest. The first day the hallway is always the darkest, like a gauntlet. The voices taunted, faggot, sissy, punk, queen, queer. Although he'd never had sex in his 15 years. And when they harassed him, it was for a reason. And when they provoked him, it became open season for the fox and the hunter, the sparks and the thunder, to put the boy under and pillage and plunder. It sometimes makes me wonder how one can hurt another. But dehumanizing the victim makes things simpler. It's like breathing with a respirator. It eases the conscience of even the most conscious and calculating violator. Words can reduce a person to an object, something more easy to hate, an inanimate entity, completely disposable, no problem to obliterate. Yes. Okay, so. <laughs> now that's what I mean, taking a risk, you know, I could have forgotten the words, I, could, I did forget the shaker, I you know, could have fallen flat on my ass, but you, were, you thought, well, you know, it's not the best rap we've ever heard, but that was all right, yeah, well done. So that's what you can do with that third number. Fourth, fourth number, um, cover version, very important. Um, 
You say you're all singers? Yes? Singers? So I need some backing vocals on this one. And um, this is an iconic song from when I was, when I was young. And the, court, the backing vocal goes, Talking about my generation. Can you do that? One, two, three, four. Talking about my generation. Like, could you sing it like you were on stage now? One, two, three, four. Talking about my generation. Okay, who can do harmonies? Okay, harmony people. Talking about my generation. Okay, all together. One, two, three, four. Talking, Talking about my generation. generation. Talking about my generation. Talking about my generation. Talking about my generation. Perfect. Okay, here we go. People try to put us down just because we get around. Before the last song in your set, tell them it's the last song. Really important. Because you'll have noticed that when people say it's the last song, there's a, a measurable warmth increases in the audience. They're now, oh, thank God, he's not going to play all night. But there's also that thing of, oh, fair enough, well, that's it, we're getting to the end, we're going to have a drink in a minute. So they give you a bit more warmth and attention through the song, and the warmth and the applause at the end is much higher, because they know you're leaving the stage. So telegraph it in advance, say, I'm, it's my last song. Thank you very much for listening. My name is, say your name clearly, because you don't want them going home going, oh, that's poor, it was good, what were they called again? And, you know, you've, you've missed your opportunity. Say the name clearly. Say, I'm going to be over, over there afterwards. I've got some flyers with a free download code if you'd like to uh, come over and say hello. Uh, I'll see you there. Don't overrun. If you play longer than your allotted time, you'll make enemies of the other bands that are on, you'll make enemies of the promoter, and you'll make enemies of the audience because they're waiting to hear those other artists who are on. And then at the end of the last song, get off stage as quick as you can while the applause is still going. You don't want to be packing up your things and walking off in silence after the applause has petered out. At the end of the show, there's a 10-minute window. For about 10 minutes after a really successful performance, they will be hyped up and ready to kind of come out and reach you and also be wanting to buy stuff. Take your own marker pen to write on stuff. Either you slip on a jacket so you look a bit different and clear the stage yourself if you have to do it, or get a friend to clear the stage for you while you nip out there with your pen and go and meet and greet. And if you are selling stuff, make sure it looks like it has value. Don't have CDRs written on with green marker pen. It doesn't matter that they're demos that you're selling. If you imagine, if you had an Ed Sheeran demo from uh, five, ye five years ago, one of his gigs, that would be like a lot of money on eBay now. Sell your stuff, but make it look like it's worth money. Right, we're now at the practical performance point where I'd like to ask, uh, I'd like to ask you to volunteer to come up and give us like 60 seconds of a cover version, just so that we can look at putting some of those skills that we're talking about here into practice. Let's have somebody who actually finds this problematic. Okay, yes. Hello, my name's Kevin. I'm singing a Usher cover. Okay. Seen a thing about you that caught my eye is the same thing that makes me, me change my mind. Kind of hard to explain, but girl, I'll try. Why don't you sit back? This may take a while. See nothing, she sort of looks just like you. Brilliant! Yeah. Yeah. How did, how did that feel? Nervous. 
You see, the only way that showed, I think, was just slightly that you were a bit frozen to the spot, you know. But the performance was just great, you know. A lovely voice, threw it out there to the room as well, you know, great mic technique as well. So what we need to think about is how to make that easier for you, getting on there. And, and I think a lot of it's about breathing, you know. Just try feeling really kind of your feet rooted to the spot. Everybody can do this, actually, just now. Just to get into the zone before the moment of actually, when you're in just in the wings or the dressing room, about to come out. It's quite worth just trying to just get settled so that you feel your feet are really heavy and you can feel your whole body kind of weighty. Feel the weight of your body. And then feel the air coming into your... Really long breaths coming out. So take plenty of oxygen in. If you let your eyes close and just count yourself down with ten breaths, from ten down to one, feeling yourself get more relaxed and more centered as you go. This, it only takes ten seconds and just gets you in the zone. So, ten. And now you're kind of ready for anything, ready for anything. So you're there in the zone. You're really rooted. You're there in the moment. See the thing about you that caught my eye. It's the same thing that makes me, me change my mind. Kind of hard to explain, but girl, I'll try. Why don't you sit back this mythic wow? See nothing, she sort of looks just like you.